Psalms 106. This is a real fascinating psalm. I, I've been really rocked by it this week. And so I wanted to just kind of talk to you a little bit today out of Psalms 106. Let me give you a little bit of the context so that as we get started, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be able to progress a little bit quicker. Um, this is a psalm that starts with great praise, but it's a corrective word. It's a psalm that exposes uh, the sins of Israel. Now, I realize everybody may not like reading this, this sort of thing. I really love it. I love to read anything that's going to give me wisdom that will show me pitfalls, that will show me uh, this small problem here caused a big problem here when it wasn't fixed while it was small. Does that make sense? These little, these little molehills turn into mountains. And there's certain things that the, the Bible will indicate, will point out that when this happened, they didn't take care of it. And because they didn't, it caused great calamity, great downfall. And I loved uh, this uh, particular chapter is marked up in my Bible and has been for years because there, there are just certain, it's like things that the Lord just unveils. He said, all right, this is where Israel blew it. Now learn from their mistake and, and you'll do fine, you know. And so I love reading that stuff because I want the wisdom to spot things early. It's when we, in raising our children, we always uh, disciplined our kids. Uh, it, all the discipline was based on attitude. We didn't wait for bad conduct. We tried to spot it early. If we could see attitude forming that was not good, uh, uh, indifference or spite or anger, whatever it might be, any of the things that all of us experience, we would always try to nip it in the bud in the area of attitude and bring discipline at that point. Then you can, protect, you can, you can prevent uh, wrong conduct, which is maybe a good idea for the rest of us to do, just to have somebody say, your attitude stinks, and, and then we can repent. So... Uh, um, I, I invite you to invite your friend to tell you that when your attitude stinks. But honestly, if you can catch certain things in their formation, then they don't ever take root to start defining who you are. Amen. Verse 1. Praise the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can declare all his praise? Blessed are those who keep justice, he who does righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have towards your people. Visit me with your salvation, that I may see the benefit of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. Verse 6, we have sinned. Let's just stop right there. So what happens is this thing starts in praise, and then he starts going into almost like an intercessory role of starting to confess and to point out, to deal with the sins. Now, I'm, we're not going to read the whole psalm. We just don't have the time, and uh, it, we'd get bogged down too easily. So what I want to do is I'm going to skim over certain parts of it and then camp there for a few minutes, and uh, let's just see how we do, all right? I want you to jump over all the way to verse 13. Verse 13, they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. He gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. This, this particular passage is, is marked up in my Bible because I, I think it's so profound. Israel is coming out of Egypt. They've been seeing the miracles. Now, here's the dangerous part of miracles is that you can become acclimated to the miraculous. If you don't find if you don't follow the sign to where it's pointing, you will get bored with the sign. You never get bored with the person it's pointing to. As long as we take the signs and automatically take them to a God encounter, then we, we never get bored with him. But you can become bored with manna on the ground every day until you, they actually got to the place they complained about supernatural food being provided for them. It's bizarre. And you and I, we can't think that we're any different because that's where we get stupid. Well, this is New Testament. Yeah, we're still made of the same kind of stuff. And so these things are written. Uh, Paul said, the, the Old Testament, he said, these things were written for our instruction. They are there to teach us how to maneuver and navigate through life. So here he says, they forgot the works of God. They forgot the water out of the rock, the man on the ground. The, imagine us living in a, in a moving community. And the center is the presence. And it can literally be seen. God's presence can be seen as a cloud during the day, right above the temple, and as a fire at night. Visibly, they, anywhere they are, they can look and see that's where God is. 
And when that cloud would pick up from the, from the tabernacle and start moving, everybody would have to pack their gear because they've got to follow the cloud because wherever he goes, that's where the food goes. You don't be stuck in a desert with no food. You follow the cloud because that's where all the complete provision for life is. It's following that cloud. So here's Israel. They're, they're in this mode of receiving. They like the miracles. They're being fed. But now it's getting old, and it says they forgot his works. Here's the deal. The works of God reveal his nature. The activities, the works of the Lord. And it's supposed to be like, like the works of the Lord. That is, that is due north. That is the compass point, is that no matter where I am in my life, if I can always remember the works of the Lord, I'll always have an understanding of his nature. As soon as I start doing life without a consciousness of the God who invades the impossible, I will start reducing life to human capability. I will end up with a God who looks like me. What religion does is it puts us in a position to recreate a God in our image, one that we understand, one that we can fully explain, and one that in some measure we can control. That's what religion does. It's vital that we have, that we serve this God who is truly God, who is able to, able and willing and oftentimes doing things that we don't understand. We don't comprehend. We don't know why he chooses to do this. And I don't mean, uh, sometimes people say we don't understand his ways and what they're referring to is the death of a child. We don't know why God took the life of the child. You know, I, I don't know if I have to go over that this morning, but just because somebody died doesn't mean God took their life. You know, otherwise, why did Jesus raise the dead? He only raised the dead because not everybody dies in God's timing. If he's raising the dead and the father's killing him, then we've got a divided house. <laughs> the, 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 the point is, is the point is, is there's stuff that goes on around us all the time, all day long, that's not from God at all. We've got to stop giving him credit. So here we've got due north is that I keep in mind the activities of God in my life, the supernatural interventions. If I lose sight of those, I start having a distorted view of his nature, and I start living under the influence of a God I can conceive of. In ministry, what happens is if I lose consciousness of the God who invades the impossible, I will reduce ministry to my personal gifts. Ministry will be all about whatever I can do naturally. If you can sing, if you can lead, if you write, it doesn't matter what you do. It just Ministry gets reduced to what you can do. And that's boring. Our ministry gifts, is, they're all wonderful. All of them are wonderful. They're like sails on a boat. You've heard me share this before. They're like sails on a boat. You know, yours might be red and white. Mine might be green and yellow. You know, it's, it's, it, we, we can sit in the harbor and admire one another's sails, but they only have one purpose. That's to catch wind. And your gifts are there to catch the breath of God. That's what it's there for. It's to be supernaturally empowered so that the significance of your existence is felt by everybody around you. The king is exalted and the kingdom is established through natural abilities that God has given every one of us. They're to be supernaturally empowered. That's why we find frequently, and in this chapter, the prayer for divine favor. Why? Because that favor comes and it takes what we have to offer in the natural, but it makes it supernaturally effective. They soon forgot his works. They didn't wait for his counsel. That, that verse bothers me. I, has anybody else here ever acted anxiously and you just didn't hang around for good advice and you got stupid? Yeah, I've never done that at all. But I've read about people who have. Yeah, they didn't wait for his counsel. They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness. They tested God in the desert. Listen to this verse. He gave them their request. But he sent leanness into their soul. The last thing you want in life is what you want. <laughs> Left to our own devices, we're not smart enough to outline the things that we need. I mean, you know, on one hand, I can talk to you and emphasize, dream in the Lord, just pray, he'll answer the desires of your heart. It's absolutely true. But when James and John asked to sit on the right and left, Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking for. And sometimes we pray for stuff that, that we, we're not ready for him to answer. And I, I, in fact, I mentioned this to you last week. 
He brings discipline into our life. Discipline is always the reward for progress. He always rewards those who are growing with discipline. It's a reward. He prunes us. He always prunes the plant that's growing so that it can bear more fruit. I'll say it again. He disciplines us so that we can survive his blessings. He sent leanness into their soul. That's a significant passage. In 3 John um, verse 2 it says, Beloved, I pray that you would prosper in all things and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. Beloved, I pray that you would prosper in every area of your life, your relationships, your business, your personal giftings, your family health, your own soundness of mind, your own all these things. I pray that you would prosper in every area of your life, the favor in the community, the favor at work, the favor in your neighborhood, the fulfillment of personal dreams and desires of ministries, that the cry of your heart would be realized. I pray that you would prosper in every area, everything, and that you'd be in good health just as your soul prospers. The point is the prosperous soul, the healthy emotions, the healthy thought life, the, the will that is bent towards serving and honoring the Lord, the pleasure of the will of God. The will of God is absolutely full of pure, pure pleasure. That that healthy soul would impact every single area of our life, including health. This passage, they insisted on having their way, and so God gave them their way, but with it came leanness of soul. Does this make sense to you? It's like it, if the Lord were to turn us over to our own devices, every area of our life would be struck with poverty. Emotions, mentally. People, even in this room, you, you, you may be prosper in certain areas of life, but you, you're poverty stricken in other areas. It's hard for you to think complimentary thoughts towards another person. You find yourself with a bent towards finding what's wrong with them and criticizing. That's, that's poverty. That's poverty of soul. That's a leanness of soul. To walk into a room and hoping that somebody will affirm you. Well, affirmation is one of the most basic needs of life. But to live off the praises of men means you'll die by their criticisms. You, you, if, if you are dependent on the stroke of somebody else, it's amazing that something so wonderful in life can be so devastating when it's out of order. A person who walks in and they don't get greeted properly, they don't get championed properly, and there's just such a poverty of soul that they need constant pumping up to just survive the day. Listen, no shame involved here. Let's just take care of the issue because that's poverty of soul. And that poverty of soul is usually the result of having our own way. It really is. I'm telling you the truth. I wouldn't, I wouldn't lie to you. All right. That's verse 20. We've got to get moving here. You guys doing all right? Verse 20. They changed their... Oh, go to verse 19. Sorry. They made a calf in Horeb. And worshipped the molded image. They changed their glory into the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God their Savior who had done great things in Egypt. Wondrous works in the land of Ham. Awesome things by the Red Sea. Isn't that a great verse? Great things, wondrous works, awesome things. They forgot God. These are crazy stories. Moses goes up on a mountain. Aaron's in charge. And the people start begging to have a God that they could actually see. And so Moses comes down and they're worshiping this false, this calf that Aaron made. And so Moses, what are you doing? He gets so ticked off on him. Aaron says, I just threw, I don't know what happened. I threw the gold into the fire and out walked this calf. It's what he said. He said, I, I threw the gold in. This calf just walked right out. <laughs> it wasn't me. It was the woman you gave me. So Aaron makes this calf out of the fear of man because they were wanting something they could see. So God says, you exchanged your glory for the glory of a calf. Now here's something interesting about creation. Everything that God made, God actually assigned a measure, a portion of glory to rest on that part of creation. 
The scripture talks about the glory of the heavens, the glory of the stars, the glory, the animal kingdom. Every animal is created with a measure of glory. Glory is a, is a weightiness. It's a significance. It's a place of importance. It's a place of value. And everything was created with a measure of glory. The plants, everything has glory on them, everything. But man, he made uniquely in his own image. Now, I can't, I can't illustrate this correctly without making some sexual references. And so there, there's just no other way to do this. The Lord doesn't want horses mating with giraffes. It's forbidden in Scripture. Why? It's always kind breeding with kind. And when you take the donkey and the horse, you get a mule who can't reproduce because it's, it's, it works against what God created. The husband and wife relationship, the intimate relationship to becoming one, is actually a type of a more significant reality, and that is Christ and his church. The unity, the union of two people becoming one is an illustration of God and his people. It's one of the great mysteries in Scripture. Why did the Lord make us in his image? Was for closeness. It was for deep personal interaction. So when man worshipped a golden calf, they took their glory, which according to scripture is actually the glory of God. It says he is the glory and the lifter of my head. God himself is the glory of man. Made in his image for the purpose of deep interaction. All right? So when man worships a false god, they take that glory and they exchange it for the glory of the image that they are worshiping. And so now, instead of being equipped for closeness and tenderness with God, we suddenly exchange the glory with that of, in this case, a calf. Do you see what's happening? It's like, it's like changing from one kind, one place of assignment in life to that of an animal. Psalms 115 pushes on this thing a little bit harder. And he says, he says, all right, you, the gods you worship, they have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, they can't hear. They have hands, they can't touch. And you've become just like them. So what is he saying? Your eyes, you worship a false god. Your eyes, you lose the ability to perceive. Do you remember in Scripture where it says, in fact, I think it was, I think it was Nineveh, they were so steeped in sin, they had lost the ability to discern right from wrong, their right hand from their left hand. They had no moral compass anymore. They were so steeped in sin. They, had, they no longer had that, that sense of right and wrong. Uh, it wasn't just violating an internal moral compass anymore. It, it had been destroyed. Why? They had become like what they worshipped. The powerful part of, of this principle is that we always become like whatever we worship. In fact, in Psalms 115, he says, they have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears that they can't hear. And then it says, and they became like the ones that they worship. The very next phrase says, O Israel, worship the Lord. In, in other words, there's momentum in a subject. You always become like what you worship. You lose your ability to touch and to sense. You lose your ability to hear the real voice of real life, of the real things that are going on around you, the voice of God, the voice of cries of people around you. You become deaf, you become blind because of the worshiping of false gods. And then he says, you become like the one you worship. So worship the Lord. You become more alive in every single area of your life because you have beheld this one and you are giving him your glory. When it says give glory to God, you can't give him glory unless you have it. And so what we do is we actually take the glory he has given to us to honor us and we actually pass it back to him. We say, no, I give you, I give you glory. I give you all the glory you've given me. All the significance you've created me for, I put in your hands. And I say, you're the one that deserves all the glory. Does, does this make sense to you? 
in the process, it's in this presence that we become changed. We become more transformed in those moments. I, I don't mean just by singing the right songs. I don't, uh, as much as I like that, it's not that. It is, it is the moment. Sometimes, you know, we can, you can be in a worship service and have an hour, uh, people around you are encountering God for an hour, and you have ten seconds of a real encounter with the Lord. The, the real heart of the matter is that we come in with a continuous offering so that it's not just something we turn on and turn off. In the glory is where there's more personal transformation that takes place than at any other point in your life. And the reason is we become like whatever we worship. And so if worshiping a calf, I exchange my glory as one who is designed to be close and tender with God, I exchange my glory for that of an animal that only receives directions from its creator, no intimate interaction, then you can see the role that people take in their life when they turn their hearts from serving the Lord. You say, well, we don't have false gods. And, and in, our, in, in this uh, culture, we don't. In other lands, they're, they're everywhere, but, but they're not here. Unless you go to Paul's definition. In Ephesians, he talks about the issue of idolatry. And he says, idolatry is greed. Greed is idolatry. Do you know materialism is not um, hoarding wealth to yourself. Materialism is a shift in values from a spirit world to a material world. It's not how much you have. It's how much influence, how much the material world influences you. Jesus is amazing. <laughs> There's a huge understatement. I was trying to find the words. I almost said he's so confusing, but he's, he's not. He's, he's, he's as simple as can be. I don't know if you know this in Scripture, but you'll see the, the word idolatry and adultery frequently in the same phrase. It's crazy. Frequently in the same phrase. Why? Because idolatry is spiritual adultery. Jesus in Luke, we, we actually looked at this for just a few minutes a few weeks ago. It's, it's this strange passage of Scripture on finances, and, and Jesus basically tells all the guys, he says, you just have to sell everything to follow me. You know, a rich young ruler comes, has this dialogue with him. He says, eh, if you really want to follow me, you have to, you have to get rid of everything. And then, uh, so the disciples were really interested. Okay, well, we've left everything to follow you. So what, happened? what about us? In, in other words, we did good, didn't we, Jesus? <laughs> we, we did really good. And Jesus said, no one has left, you know, farms or homes, or whatever goes through all these things, uh, who will not receive a hundred times as much in this life. Here, here's the confusing piece. I don't know if you're following this. That money stuff is going to kill you. Give it all up. Follow me. Okay. Glad to be rid of that. He says, no, here's a hundred times more than what you gave up. <laughs> that thing that's going to make you miserable, here's a whole bunch more of it. Why? Because something happens when we yield. It's not the money. It's the love of money. Something happens when he takes us through the refinement, through the disciplines where we say, we give this, and something happens to my heart where I learn to live not governed by the material world, but instead governed by God so that I govern the material world. Does that make sense? It's like the very thing you give away that you thought would kill you is the very thing he rewards you with. <laughs> Jesus was identifying this in, in taking his disciples through this process. This is in the Gospel of Matthew, and he says, he says, you can't serve God and mammon. And then he goes on and he describes the two relationships, those who walk with God and those who walk governed with, by mammon. Mammon, he actually refers to as a spirit being that influences economics. What are the two extremes in economics? 
obscene wealth, building personal kingdom, abject poverty, where you constantly fear loss. And the devil doesn't mind which class you're in. Because in both groups, he influences you emotionally and mentally by what you own instead of you becoming the master over what you own. And so Jesus illustrates this. He says, here, let me, here's my money. He says, you can't serve God and mammon, personality, mammon. For either you will love the one and hate the other. You will hate the spirit that manipulates people's lives into reducing their life from the glory of God to the glory of an idolatrous image. And that's what we're talking about here. That's what I, greed is idolatry. It is the worship of a, of a calf. The exchange of the role of significance to shape the course of world history reduced to a pawn in the enemy's hands. He says, either you will love the one and hate the other. That's the person who walks with the Lord. Your love for God is oftentimes measured by what you hate. This whole idea that we just love God and love everything. No, no. Hate must be a part of our life. Now, I realize that sounds so bizarre, and I'm certainly not talking about hating people, hating, you know, uh, people groups or political parties or whatever. I'm, that's not it. If, if the neighborhood bully were attacking one of my children, I would throw myself in between the two with a hatred for what is driving that person to try to beat my, my child. Why? Because I love, because I love this, I hate this. Does that make sense? It, 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 has to be, it has to become manifest. This idea that we are a people that don't have the emotion of, of hate is, is absolutely wrong. In fact, I'll tell you what, in some ways, you can only love God in the measure that you hate sin. It's like there, something has to well up within, within us where there is not a toleration for things. I'm not talking at all about pointing fingers at other people. I'm talking about in our own personal life that we become so disgusted with something. I've hassled with this for years. I'm so sick and tired of this. And we, you know, we put ourselves on a fast. We cry out to God. We seek the Lord. We get counsel. We have people pray for us. We do whatever we can. Why? Because we hate that. So he, he, he takes the two relationships. Either you will love the one and hate the other, not the dollars, but the spirit that controls and reduces life from worshipers of God to worshipers of golden calves. All right? Either you will love the one, hate the other, or you will, this is Jesus' wording, or you will hold to the one and despise the other. During offerings, you can always tell, not by what's given, but you can tell where people's devotion are. Because oftentimes, the despising rises up in the middle of an offering. They despise that they're talking about money again. That just tells me what you're holding on to. Don't ever allow yourself to be coerced into giving here. That is never the point. I'd rather you keep your money. That's, that's not the deal. The point is, is that hearts are exposed when it comes down to how we handle the material life. And a more deeper and more profound truth is the fact that what I worship is seen by how I handle the material world. Either I will love the one and hate the other, or I will hold to the one and I'll despise. That went over pretty well. Let's... Uh, Let's just keep moving. I've got to hurry and finish. All right. <laughs> Let's jump over. We've got two more sections to read. I'll try to be quick on these two. Verse 24. Uh, then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his word, but complained in their tents. Did not heed the voice of the Lord. Look at these two phrases. I have them underlined in my, my Bible. They did not believe but complained. Complaining comes out of unbelief. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I was hoping for amens and everything. I, want, I, want, I wanted to feel really good about that state. It's too late. It's too late. I, I'm telling you, I'm, complaining comes out of unbelief. It comes out of a core attitude of heart. Now, thankfully, we can repent quickly when we see that stuff coming. But the point is, is it helps me to understand where that comes from, where it comes from. The, the inability to find something good to say in a situation, the inability to turn, turn from the master role of wishing this would get done for me to the servant role where I empower people around me. Those switches can be done quickly if there's a change of heart. But it helps me to realize, all right, I'm operating out of something that's inferior. I'm operating out of unbelief. And I'm choosing circumstances or people as my targets. Quick repentance does what? Suddenly I become the servant. I look for what I can compliment. Because complaining comes out of unbelief. All right? One more portion, then we'll end. You guys still all right? Yeah. Yeah. Verse 28. They joined themselves to Baal. They ate sacrifices made to the dead. They provoked him to anger with their deeds. A plague broke out among them. Phinehas stood up and intervened, and the plague was stopped, and that was accounted to him for righteousness for all generations. Now, this is a weird situation. We're going to end on kind of a weird note here. Israel... They started getting so accustomed to the miraculous, they, they lost. How do you lose sight of what's happening before your eyes every day? I don't know, but anyway, they did. They lost sight of the works of the Lord. They lost sight of the voice of the Lord, his counsel, his word into their life. And they actually start settling. And one of the Israelite men developed a relationship with a Midianite woman. As forbidden. There is no intermarrying. Paul said it this way. There's no fellowship between the table of God and the table of demons. You can't get the two to merge. That's unsanctified mercy if you try to get two opposite worlds. You can live with honor, but you cannot live with intercourse. There's no fellowship. And so... A plague starts breaking out. The, the people are worshiping these false gods. Moses is ticked off again, I'm sure. Phinehas, who is, who is Aaron, he's, Aaron's the, the main priest guy, head, high priest. Aaron's grandson, Phinehas, sees what's going on. People start dying. 24,000 people died in this thing. They start worshiping these false gods. This, this uh, Israelite has this Midianite woman that he wants to marry. And Phinehas... He sees what's happening. He sees a plague breaks out because sin invites plagues. God never has to release it. All he has to do is let us live with our own choices. Phineas picks up a javelin and he runs into the guy's tent who's got this Midianite woman and he puts the, the spear of the javelin through the husband and the woman. Kills them both. And the plague stopped. Now, don't go buy a javelin. Some of you don't trust your discernment quite yet. You, you, you perhaps think I'm talking about your neighbor or your boss. Now, this is not, this is not, see, there's a lot of people out there showing religious zeal against other people. This zeal is concerning your own personal life. Kill compromise before it kills you. Compromise brought in a plague. And when Phinehas rose up with the javelin, he went and he put a spear through both of them. They died, and the plague literally just stopped. Why? Because you kill compromise before it kills you. Compromise is the welcome mat to deception. It actually broadcasts, you can come here, deception. And it weakens the ability to discern and recognize. That's why those who worship idols become like them. They lose their ability to see, to hear, to taste, to discern, to recognize environments and and causes and understand. All that stuff just starts dying, gets diminished until we become little pawns in the devil's hands. 
And that's, that's what the Lord is doing here. He's trying to, he's raising up disciples and he says, all right, you're going to have to leave all that. And they say, fine, we'll follow you. And then he says, all right, before this is over, you'll get a hundred times much, as much. Why? Because you've, you've navigated through life to where I can trust this world to be subject to you. And that's the whole design of the gospel is that the gospel empowers you to take what's of the enemy, put it under your feet, and take what's of people around you, and you come under them to empower them. You rule over in the spirit world so that darkness doesn't rule, but you come under and empower people. It's not ruling over power, over people. The verse that struck me, actually the whole reason I wanted to read this thing to you, and I have to end with this tiny little thought, is actually the whole reason I wanted to go into this psalm, is the last phrase that says, it was accounted to him for righteousness. John Paul Jackson was here several years ago, and he said, um, the Lord spoke, I think he spoke audibly if I remember right, that the, the, the next great move of God that we had seen in our country would come out of Romans chapter 4. And so I took three years, and I read Romans 4 every single day for, four, for three years, except for five days. Five days I didn't, uh, uh, because of time zone, uh, international flights, um, flying from here to Australia. And I, I didn't read it till I got there, and so it was a different day. So <laughs> the, the, I, have, I have to be honest when I say every single day, so... It's, it's, not a, it's not a point of guilt. I just want to clarify and make sure that I'm honest when I tell you. Every day I re- read this chapter. And the reason was, was because of this, this word about the move of God coming out of this chapter 4. Chapter 4, if you're familiar with it, you know it's a chapter of extraordinary faith. Abraham, the father of faith in this chapter. What does it say about Abraham? It says, here's this, here's this guy. He's 100 years old. He just believes God. He didn't consider the natural elements, the natural circumstances. His wife's 90, he's 100. He still believed that God was going to provide him with a son. That faith in that moment of absolute impossibility so impressed God, God said, I'm going to his ledger, and I'm going to write righteous in it, and it's just going to make up for every stupid thing he's ever done, because I now consider this guy righteous. Because of his faith. His faith just absolutely launched him into a place with the Lord that... that he is, to this day, he is called the father of faith. Abraham so impacted God that God calls him the father of faith. Now, I, I don't know what you do with that. I, I, I think it's incredible that a person can impress God. I mean, he's not, he, he's not just twiddling his thumbs going, oh, another stupid person. You know, <laughs> there's, yeah, oh. Wow, I gave you the ability to do that. You think I'm supposed to be impressed? I can do that much better than you can. And, I mean, it's, it's, he's impressed. He's so impacted by Abraham that he just calls him the father of faith. He's so impacted by David that Jesus is called the son of David for eternity. His own son is called the son of David for eternity. <laughs> what kind of a mark do you make on this God who wants to be impacted by you? And so the only other time I know of in the Bible where it says it was accounted to him by faith, uh, accounted to him as righteousness, was Abram. I, I didn't even recognize I don't even have this verse underlined in my own, in my own Bible because when, I, when I've read it through the years, it never stood out until this week. I read it. I went, here's a guy who takes a javelin. He puts the spear through the man and the woman. He stops a plague. His righteous zeal for the house of the Lord so impacted God that God did the same thing for him that he did for Abram. And he went to his leisure and he says, all right. This one's righteous. And not only that, if you look at it, it says he's righteous forever uh, in the generations that follow. In other words, I am going to mark him so deeply that every one of his descendants are impacted from this point on. Zeal for what? For the house. Not zeal against another person. Not zeal against even the sin of another person. It's the stuff that we deal with in our, in our own lives. You kill the compromise. So it doesn't kill you. Let's stand. All right. I went a little longer than I planned to, but you made me. Eric's going to preach tonight. It'll be outrageous as always. I'm looking forward to it. 
Jesus said, it was said of Jesus, and I believe he made the statement himself, if I remember correctly, zeal for thy house has consumed me. And to be honest, I think the first, the first expression of that zeal that I remember, at least in the scripture, is Phineas. Zeal for the house of the Lord so consumed him that he put to death the thing that was killing off the people he loved, even those who had deserved it because they were worshiping false gods. Remember, these are people that deserve it. They've been watching miracles. They've ignored God. They've turned their hearts to idols. And yet Phineas wanted to protect that group. And he went after and he killed the thing that was devouring them. This issue of the fear of God is a big deal. I, I get concerned when I hear people, they say, well, God's my daddy. He's my papa God. I crawl into his lap. I understand it, and I believe that's absolutely right, but he's still God. He's still God, and it's just smart to fear God. There's a, there's a fear that drives people from God, but there's a fear that brings us to him. I, when our kids were growing up for a while in Weaverville, we lived right on the highway, and these logging trucks, trucks would be flying up and down the highway, and and uh, my kids were, had learned to ride bikes during that time. And so when, uh, when they were riding bikes out on the parking lot in front of our house, I would tell them, I'd say, no, you cannot cross the road. If you cross the road and you survive, <laughs> if you live the experience of crossing that road and survive, you will have to face me. Let me put it into different terms. If my love doesn't keep you on this side of the highway, then my fear, you fearing me, will. Does that make sense? I, I only had one of my kids do that. <laughs> the other one, the other one. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I, was, I was thinking about this story this, uh, this week. I missed the mercy of God. He's alive. Because a friend of ours had to swerve the car. Because he was just a little guy crossing the highway. He just thought he'd see what was on the other side. And anyway, thank you, Jesus. You spared my son, Eric. And he got to meet me when he came back. <laughs> and you know what? That's the tenderness of the Lord. He puts a fear in us because sometimes we miss the love part. And the other is just insurance. Some people are just too stubborn to get the, the tenderness part. They're just not in that mood. And they, they get the fear part. I hope this is making sense because they work in tandem. They really do. Father, I pray for a grace, for zeal, for the house of the Lord, for one another, for the walk in purity, our devotion to you, our devotion to people would consume us the way Jesus confessed it. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.